say about that? <laughs> Marta Q and Apollo? No projection issues there. <laughs> Fantastic, Mela. Wonderful job. Wonderful job. We have been on a journey over the last few weeks talking about the second coming of Jesus. This should be on our mind, amen? This is what we're waiting for. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we explored the implications of what that is. Last week, we talked a bit about how Jesus is just cannot wait to see us as well. So from his perspective, what it looks like, him coming to get us. Uh, this Sabbath today, we're going to spend some time kind of unmasking or unfolding, exposing, you might say, the opposite side of the great controversy from the devil's perspective. You better believe that if, if the second coming is what ends his reign, he's focused on it, wouldn't you say? So we're going to talk today here a little bit about that and what Jesus really does say about his return to earth to save us all. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious Father in heaven, we are already so blessed. Baby dedications and baptisms and a beautiful song and our hearts are filled. But Lord, as they remain open to you, we also pray that you'd fill us with your spirit. Speak to us individually. Let us hear your voice because we know that right now is a very important time of preparing for the greatest event that this world will ever see, and that is the second coming of Jesus. Speak to our hearts, we pray today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was 1969. Neil Armstrong and his lunar module pilot, Buzz Aldrin, lifted off to the moon in Apollo 11 for the first time. On Earth, Armstrong's wife, Janet, sighed as she watched the rocket leaving the atmosphere. It was reported later that she sighed in that moment, wishing that it was splashdown rather than liftoff day, saying only when re-entry has taken place can I relax. As we sigh over growing troubles today in our world, we must realize that, the only, that only the re-entry of Jesus Christ to earth will bring full and complete rest to our hearts. I was looking at a survey from 2006, they haven't done one since then, by Pew Research, and this was on one of the areas that they cover, religion and public life. And what they discovered was in their survey, 79% of Christians said that they believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That seems like a good, healthy number, right? But as they dug a little deeper, they found out that far fewer than that number saw Christ's return as imminent. Overall, just 20% of all Christians expected Christ to return in their lifetime. Among those who said the Bible is the literal word of God, probably speaking of evangelicals more, and some mainline Protestants that have a tradition of the second coming, they found that that number was only a little higher at 37%. So instead of good news, there seems to be a little bit of bad news within Christianity in regard to the eager anticipation of Christ's return. While Christians as a whole are losing a sense of hope and expectation of Jesus' near return, I can assure you that the enemy of our souls has not lost sight of this event that stands right before us. In the words of John the Revelator, Satan knows he has a short 
time. I'm glad for that. The second coming of Christ will bring an end to Satan's agenda. Because it will be such a life-altering event for him, it's his last opportunity today during this short time to do everything he can to have his way. Now, I don't like to talk much about the adversary. I'd rather focus on Jesus and his truth. But one of the things that Jesus did in sharing and teaching his truth is he exposed the agenda of the enemy. He spoke right to it. And so I will venture in that water today as we begin the message. What God has said in his word Satan twists to his own benefit. He uses the Bible to confuse and to deceive, and he is quite successful at it. And contrary to what most Christians actually believe today, he is not going after the unbelievers in this world. Satan is not concerned about those who do not profess faith in Christ. What he is concerned about is the church and making sure that the church does not accomplish the work that Christ has given it to do. And so that is why he is going after Christians and their teachings in regard to Christ's return. Jesus said in John 8, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the question today is, are we as a whole, as a Christian body around the world, are we aware of his intentions? A survey by the Barna Group not too long ago, I was really amazed by this. Uh, they, they put out a survey and, and basically just one quick question. Do you believe the devil is a real person, a real being? And you may find it difficult because as Seventh-day Adventists, we've known about this conflict between Christ and Satan and the enemy's work for a long time. 65% said no, he was simply a figure of evil. How can you guard yourself against deception if you don't believe there is a deceiver? And if you want an example of his work today, and this is just a small one, just look at how many have fallen for the lies disseminated by the website QAnon. It's not hard for the enemy to sway and to deceive people. He enjoys it. And so this is why I believe Jesus weighed into the fray in Matthew 24, Luke 21 are the two biggest passages on what's called the Olivet Discourse, his teachings to the disciples on the Mount of Olives, not long before his crucifixion. And as we pick up, as we kind of step into his discussion, his conversation with the disciples, we read in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, these words. Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed, be careful, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. When I read that, I don't think of it as just some cold objective counsel, hey, you gotta watch out for this. What I see is the heart of love in Christ for his people, not wanting them to be deceived. He wants to make sure that they are not misled and taken by some deceiver. And especially at this time when Christ was 
the Messiah, the real Messiah, we had, uh, there, there were reports in extra biblical materials that showed that there were many people at that time that were stepping up claiming to be the Christ. See, that's kind of the way the enemy works. He sees what's happening. He knows the, the prophecies of the Messiah and Daniel pointed to that time period. And all of a sudden, what springs up are a bunch of people claiming to be Christ. But Jesus is telling his disciples, take heed, let no one deceive you. He comes back to that again, this time pointing to the last generation in the history of earth. In verse 23, same chapter, we're going to be in this chapter for a lot today. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up to, he, uh, to Matthew chapter 24. And this time we're going to read from verses 23 to 26. Jesus tells the disciples, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. There it is again. See, I'm letting you know ahead of time. This is important. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. The deception in the last days of false Christ and the false Christ is so powerful that will cause the elect to even question their own beliefs. This passage from the book, The Great Controversy, I want to encourage you to get this book and read it. I, there's no better time like today than to read this book. The Great Controversy. I'm reading from page 624. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now, the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. Now, what's the difference between personation and impersonation? Do you know? How many of you have had a chance to see an impersonator? Um, I've seen a few of them. Uh, they're clever. They're funny. Many of them do their impersonations very well. The thing is, though, that the audience that's watching the impersonator knows that it is not the person in reality. But when a personation happens, deception is behind it. There is an effort to conceal the real identity of the person who is personating an individual. So in this case, what we find here is that Satan personates Christ. He pretends, he mimics as best he can the return of Jesus so as to deceive the world and thus fulfilling the words of Christ, his warning, see, I've told you beforehand, if false Christ, when he comes, don't go out. Don't pay any attention to it. Satan has been working on his grand delusion for a long time. And he has set things up today sufficiently to where he foresees tremendous success. And here is his prime objective. We, this is now before he's even cast out of heaven. This, these are the words that are coming to when he was called Lucifer. Lucifer, never, don't name your child Lucifer, but Lucifer was a good name. It was a beautiful name until we identified the adversary, Satan, with that former name that he once had. He's not called Lucifer anymore, by the way. He's called the adversary, Satan. Here's what he said. This is speaking his words, uh, coming, of course, from 
God's mouth himself through the prophet Isaiah. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For if you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Now that's a powerful statement. He's going to sit in the midst of a congregation on the farthest sides, sides of the north. And then he concludes here. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Satan not only wants to be like the Most High, he's looking for ways to be worshipped as the Most High. And he is not satisfied to deceive unbelievers. He wants to attract those who worship Christ, who are waiting for his return, and he wants to turn their affections to himself. Paul the Apostle says that this plan was already being implemented in his day. From the book 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, we read that concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So concerning the second coming, church, he writes, I want to tell you something. He asks them, Verse 2, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by word or be either by spirit or word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes himself, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits... Look at, listen to the language. He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Don't be shaken that Jesus has already come or this day's already appeared, because before that day appears, Satan's going to pull off an over unbelievable, almost undeniable deception. Now, this passage in 2 Thessalonians that we just read from applies to the little horn in Daniel and the Antichrist power in Revelation. It's a religious institution that existed in the Middle Ages with unrivaled authority for 1,260 years, then suffered a deadly wound only to rise again in the last days. Yes, it, it does pertain to that. But these prophetic words also apply to Satan himself, who will make his own personal coming. That word coming is parousia, the second coming, the appearance of Christ. So he is the ultimate antichrist. Paul goes on in verse 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So this brings us to an important point of how we resist temptation or deception. And that is to develop a love of the what? The truth. You know, as I think and I've taught about truth for many years now, I've come to the conclusion that there are several kind of perspectives of truth, several levels of truth. I'm not talking about different truths, plural, but truth has several perspectives, several levels. Number one, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? He is the epitome of truth. He is our truth. But secondly, the word of God is also truth. Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus said. Your word is truth. 
And thirdly, there's a truth in self-awareness. Knowledge of oneself. David said in his psalm where he repented of his sin with Bathsheba, he repeated these words, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. There's this truth of knowing who we really are so that we would desire Jesus to fill our lives. Amen? Now, there's a reason why I'm, a practical reason why I'm revealing this here to you today. It's because when this happens, when Satan personates Christ, our response must not be to flee. Our response must be to expose him. To reveal to the world that that is not Satan. And that is not Christ. That is Satan. Because if we're not doing that, who's going to say anything? There's a reason why Jesus has given us this message and an awareness of what will happen in these days. And I don't like to focus on it. I'd rather spend on something that is happy. But yet here it is. In the middle of Christ's teaching on the Mount of Olives. If you read a little further in the Great Controversy, the next page, page 625, you'll find these words. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the power del powerful delusion that takes the world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. So you cannot rely on my word. Don't let me dictate what, is, what you believe, or for any other pastor, for that matter. Have a big amen on that one. I just want to point you to the word, the testimony of Christ. And there's another reason for that, too. Paul the Apostle again weighs in on this same topic in 2 Corinthians 11. He talks about these false apostles, deceitful workers who transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. <clears throat> Did you know that Satan has ministers? Now you do, if you didn't already before. And the only way to tell whether or not they are speaking the truth is found in the words again of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is what? No light in them. My friends, you've got to know the Word of God. You've got to spend time in it. And not just a quick reading of, of certain passages, but an in-depth study and time with God, asking His Spirit to guide you into all truth, because the Holy Spirit's name is the Spirit of truth. And He will guide you into all truth. That's a promise from Jesus himself. Let's go back to Matthew 24 again and take a closer look at what Jesus has to say about his second coming. Uh, as, as I'm sure you've heard this story several times, the best way to know if something is a counterfeit is to know the true, right? If you know the true really well, you can see a counterfeit. I'm picking up here with Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, 
and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to another. It sounds like a pretty awesome event, doesn't it? Uh, this isn't something that you would just miss. This is worldwide. This is everywhere. There is no mistake when Jesus comes, you will see him. And where will you see him? Up in the clouds, coming to this earth. And not only that, he has the ability to make it a, a miracle of letting everybody around this, this round globe see him at the same time. I don't know how he's going to do it. I have no idea. That's just amazing to me, though, isn't it? It's going to be miraculous. Jesus will not come in secret. He will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, there's this inclination that exists within all of us. I've got it. You've got it. It's called escapism. Have you heard of that term before, escapism? When conflict comes, when trouble comes, when pain and suffering are staring at you in the face, you want to escape. Am I right? Get out of there. I want to just get out of there. I don't want to, ha I don't want to endure anything. I don't like pain. Well, I don't know if anybody who likes pain, but we just want to escape from that kind of stuff. And because of that, I think that it's one of the reasons why we see a rapidly accelerating number of cases in alcoholism and drug abuse. It's also why we see a, an increase in suicides. It's one way to get out of here. But God would not have us take that quick route out. He has promised to be with us. He will be with you through trouble. Whatever you're going through, whatever difficulties you're facing now, he will get you through it. Don't give up. And we cannot give up what's happening on this earth because Jesus will soon be on his way. Now, this same kind of thinking, escapism, exists within the church, the, the Christian church at large as well. Especially as Jesus talks about, in the last days there will be persecution, there will be trouble, a tribulation period. But the reality is that Jesus is the only one that can take us out of this world, and he's going to come back in person to do it. He's not going to give the church a short way out. Escapism is the foundation of a relatively new theory called the secret rapture. Although the seed was planted a few hundred years ago in the futurist method of prophetic interpretation, yes, there's lots of different methods, most of them new, the secret rapture idea was more fully developed in the dispensational teachings of John Nelson Darby and Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. And they were around about the 1800s. You see an ex a growing, and then late, even in the 1900s, an explosion of this dispensational teaching that's kind of spurred on by futuristic ideas of prophecy. And these teachings, these teachings that have been out for a, a little while now, about 200 years, give some basic theories. There's some ideas behind that. I want to share what those are with you. First of all, there's a secret rapture of the church before the second coming. Those who aren't taken by Christ, that is secretly raptured, will experience seven years of tribulation. Then the Antichrist appears in the middle of the tribulation, and Jesus then returns with his church after the seven years and sets up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. 
The problem with this theory is that it doesn't have a lot of support in Scripture. In fact, from what we've already read about Christ and his second coming, that means the time after the first. First coming, first century, soon to come. The problem is that, yes, it's not in the Bible, but there, it goes, it's bigger than that. It's fitting into what the enemy is pulling together, what he's packaging to deceive the world. And that's why I just, I've got to talk about it. Not only does it give people the idea that they will have a second chance if they miss out on the secret rapture, but it disarms them from being able to see that the supposed Christ is actually the Antichrist. Because in their mind, think of this, in their mind, the Antichrist comes after the secret rapture, halfway through the seven years of tribulation. So unless the rapture happens, the secret rapture has happened, the Antichrist can't appear yet, right? So the theory goes. So when Satan comes on the scene as the Antichrist and appears as Christ himself, they're going to say, well, the secret rapture hasn't happened yet, so this has got to be Jesus himself. He's come in person to take us home. Wrong. And I believe that's why Jesus adds to his illustration as to what will happen during the second coming that is audible and visible. He does this in the rest of his message to the disciples. Verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so goes the argument by those that espouse the secret rapture. Look, one is taken, the other's left. And Jesus hasn't come yet. See, there it is. Well, I'd like to use this just briefly to give you kind of a basic understanding of what it means to apply Scripture and understand it in its proper context. Because, again... This is something you should be able to share with someone if they ask at some point. So I just want to, this is going to come up. Notice that it begins by saying that as in the days of Noah were, that what surprised them was this flood that came in took them all away. Now, I ask you a question. Of the two groups, those in the ark and those outside of the ark, which ones were taken away by the flood? Those outside the ark, those that were the wicked. And so when you follow that context through here, when Jesus says that two will be left in the field, one taken, the other left, two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left, would you rather in that scenario be taken or left? Left. Because you don't want to be taken. Remember the flood took away the wicked. So those taken away of the two in each here are taken not to heaven, but to destruction. And if you have any question about this, 
Look at Luke 17, because remember I said Luke 21 is actually the big passage with the Mount of, uh, of Olives speech or, or teaching that Christ gives his disciples. But in Luke 17, it picks up this specific part of that message. Listen to what Jesus says, or this dialogue between Christ and his disciples. The disciples asked him, where, Lord? In other words, where are they taken? These two, uh, the two people, where are they, where are they taken to? And the response is, where is the dead body? Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So there's no question about the taking and the left. You don't want to be taken. Say, I don't want to be taken. <laughs> I want to be left behind. Left and remain till I see Jesus with my own eyes. Now, this is why I believe the book of Revelation tells us in symbolic language in chapter 19, you have the second coming in chapter 19 of Revelation, by the way, right on the heels of that, it says that the birds gather together to eat the flesh of kings and those that have died at the second coming. So this is how the Bible works. What you see one place is followed up by another place. It can be matched with another place. And you put these passages together. That's how you discover truth. And Jesus didn't make this ambiguous. He made it clear. But I want to go back as I conclude today to what Jesus told us to do as we get close to his appearing. Because we are not called to keep our eyes on what the enemy is doing. We're called to keep our eyes on Jesus. And yes, he may ask us at times to step in and to help someone navigate a very challenging or maybe complicated, confusing topic such as this. But our focus is Jesus and what he has revealed through his word. Amen? Jesus said, you be ready. When the Son of Man comes, you be ready. Here he's not emphasizing awareness, but preparedness. It's not enough to just be aware of the truth of what's going to happen. That won't save you. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready. And notice, Jesus didn't say get ready. He said be ready. It's a condition. It's a state that we're in because of our relationship with Jesus. He loves you. Last week we saw he can't wait to come back and get you and bring you home with him. But it's time that we not only recognize and are aware of that, that we are prepared for that. Amen? Amen. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, We then as workers together with him who also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't receive the salvation, this grace that God has poured out on you in vain. But instead, verse 2, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. My friends, today may be that day of salvation for you. For you to make that full commitment to Jesus. I don't know what else we need in this world to happen to get us to wake ourselves up and realize that the second coming is on its, it's, it's right at the door. To me, I've seen enough over the last year or so. Even if it does calm down for a while, things are happening to move us toward this event, and it's happening very quickly. It's one thing to know how Jesus will come and to know about the enemy's deceptions, but this will not save you. The faith of Jesus will save you. And exercising faith 
in Jesus will make him your Lord every day of your life. You see, we just don't need a savior to come and take us out of here. We need a Lord to walk with us through the trouble. Too often we have to go through trouble to find out, to figure out that we need the Lord. Let's figure it out way before the trouble comes. We need the Lord today, tomorrow, and until Jesus comes so that we might live with him forever. It's time to go deeper in your relationship with him. It's time to go deeper. I want to invite you, if you want to go deeper, if you want to to get closer to Jesus, to understand more of his word and to be prepared for his coming, to stand where you're at. Just as a commitment to let him know that this is your desire. You want to go deeper. You want to know him better. There are too many distractions in this world. And we need to make sure that those distractions are put away so that we can have the time that we need every day with Jesus. Listen, I confess, even as a pastor, I can probably, I won't speak for Pastor Mark and Pastor Melanie, but I can speak for myself that sometimes I get up and there's so much to do, I hit the ground running. And I can get about halfway through my day and I realize something's missing. Oh yeah, (laughs) I forgot to invite Jesus to spend the day with me. And that's why I have on my phone a reminder that pops up, pray, time to pray. So I see it, oh yeah, let's pray. Get down on my knees and pray. Just little things like that can help us. Use your devices to to remind you that Jesus is near. But as you stood here just now, the Lord sees that. He recognizes your desire. And he's there prepared to draw close. So draw close to him and open your heart to him. Because we only have one hope in this world. That is the hope in the coming of the Lord. It wouldn't be right unless we sung this song at least once during this series. Amen? We have this hope. Would you join me in singing this song as we contemplate the return of Jesus? We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Father in heaven, we long for you to send Jesus, for you to say to your son, go get my children. Lord, that day, we know it's soon, but right now as we wait, we know the main and the primary mission is to save everyone that you can. So Lord, may we, may we be a part of that salvation army that is to go to the world, to not only talk about Yes, the exposing the enemy and what he's trying to do, yeah, that's all a part of it. But the key part is the love of Christ for his people and how he wants to reside within each heart through his spirit. Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your spirit on your church 
May we enter a new era, a new age of being filled with your spirit and then being empowered to speak and proclaim the everlasting gospel to the world. Lord, we thank you for calling us to salvation and to an understanding of this truth. Lord, may we not be selfish about it, but may we open our hearts and our minds and our voice to share the wonderful good news with anyone who will hear it. Thank you, Father. Create divine appointments. Introduce us to someone who needs the gospel of Jesus and let them also rejoice in the hope that they have found because of our voice and speaking to them the words of life. Lord, your grace is sufficient for us in these last days. We claim it. And we thank you for the promise to draw near to us and protect us and to keep us in your care. For we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And in his name, all God's people today said, amen, amen. Please be seated.